Thank you, Mr. Evans. I would like to especially thank the two uh, other first councillors, the Denver and the Father Putin's councillors, for making this possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Shaw. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. I would like to thank also my good friends who made our visit here possible, and I'm very proud to count uh, Ms. Kim Savit as my very good friend, and Mr. Mark Savit, who's been uh, extremely helpful to us when we work together in Washington, and I would like to tell you that you have a very good addition to the Colorado family of experts here. This is one among the most knowledgeable people about our part of the world. I will uh, try to speak as brief as possible, so we have more time for questions and answers, and I don't overwhelm you with my overbearing accent. I will speak in English, but if you don't understand, that's my fault. So please do interrupt me and say that uh, you don't understand. It was a very good asset for me when I was a press officer. Whenever uh, I would say something stupid, I would just say they misquoted me and misunderstood me. <laughs> that's, that's a very useful thing for us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a delight to be here. I, in these two days that Vice Council Balogwana and myself have been in Colorado, we pretty much traveled in one the place. It's a beautiful place. We, went to University of Denver, went to Golden Colorado, we even saw the Red Rock Amphitheater. I still have suspicions it's a man-made, but <laughs> Kim was trying to convince me that that was just a coincidence of, coincidence of nature. I come from a country most people can't pronounce. It's, uh, it's called the Republic of Azerbaijan. And just today is 21st, three days ago, we marked the 17th anniversary of our independence. So when, when I say that we have to understand the, the span of shortness of existence of an independent republic, it's a very ancient place and a very ancient nation, but as a state, it re-emerged only in 1991. To understand the, the peculiarity of our position, I will ask you to imagine for a second that the United States of America, instead of having Canada and Mexico, has Russia to the north and uh, Iran instead of Mexico, and the United States of America is not the size of it is as it is of 50 states, and it is only a state of uh, size of a state of Maine. Just imagine the situation. Uh, I, it's not to say that our neighbors are not pleasant people; they are, but um, it is a difficult neighborhood. Let's put it that way. What we have managed to do, I think, since we have emerged, is to to become a player in the regional politics. And so it's had, it has not been easy. And there are things which made it possible, and not least of them is the support from the United, uh, from the United States. The United States has been a very a loyal and a supportive presence in the region. Unfortunately, recently, the United States has been very much engaged in the Middle East. It's been too, uh, we believe, too focused on Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan, somewhat abandoning other interests. And that may not be, in long term, a good idea. And uh, let me tell you why. Because Azerbaijan is one of those countries in the Caucasus which are friendly to the United States. We have good uh, relation with the stands in Central Asia. And also, jointly with Georgia and Turkey, we've been building a very pure Western axis, which we call East-West Corridor. East-West Corridor is based on delivering uh, energy resources of the Caspian Sea to the European and world markets. The most obvious example of that is a pipeline, oil pipeline going from Baku to the Turkish port of Jehan, um, which is called Baku Bilisi Jehan, it goes to Georgia, to Turkey. But think for a second about that. That is a non OPEC pro Western supply of oil which terminates in a NATO nation at the open sea. Uh, I'm not making that up, that's our pipeline. I mean, this is serious. And it already supplies about 30% of Israel's oil. It goes to the world markets. That pipeline allows us to prosper, but it also contributes to global energy diversity. And let me step back and go back a little bit on why, why that, that is important. In uh, 1994, Azerbaijan pioneered the reopening of the Caspian Sea to the, uh, to the Western companies. The, the capital city of Baku has always been, it was actually the place of the first oil boom of the 19, uh, of 1900s. And there are many stories about that, that's, that's very rich history of the first oil exploration in the Caspian. But after the Soviet 
Bolshevik invasion in 1920s. It, um, it became enclosed within the Soviet Union. Then in 1994, we reopened it. And I often hear, living in California, I often hear that oil, oil, and oil is, is bad. I usually say oil is not bad, oil is just a product. It's what you do with oil that what matters. And why it matters is because what we live today and what we see today, both in our part of the world and in different places, but mostly with the, with the former Soviet republics, is a reflection of the choices we made in the early days of our independence. And there are three things which under, uh, basically under the right understand, of Azerbaijan's understanding of foreign policy. First of all, we decided that we wanted to deliver energy resources to the, web, uh, to the market, to the free markets. How do we do that? We needed to attract Western investment, we understood that. But how do we attract the Western investment in a country which is so new, which is relatively unstable, which just lived to a civil war, and which was engaged in a war with neighboring Armenia, and we just lost about 20% of our territory to Armenian occupation, and we lost, uh, and we have about 1 million people refugees in a country of 8 million. That's, that's one of the highest uh, per capita uh, ratio. I, I was a, a UNHCR officer working with the High Commission, so it was not good. What we decided to do, the government of Azerbaijan said, look, I went to the Western companies and said, what do you need to make sure that things happen? You know? And they told us, we need to believe in the sanctity of content. And the Azerbaijani government pioneered the practice, which is still, I think, is unparalleled. I haven't seen other nations in the region at this point that. What we said, we said, every PSA, Production Sharing Agreement, which is signed with an energy company from the West, or generally international energy company, will then be ratified by the parliament and become a law of the land. So neither side can violate that. Or if it, 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 any changes will take so much headache going to the parliament, it would probably not, probably not worth it. The Western companies took that. It is still the practice in Azerbaijan. Uh, that is still important. It, the Western companies first liked it very much because they were expecting us to violate our agreement. Then they, of course, got less happy because we began demanding that they don't violate their agreement. But, uh, but in general, the factor of predictability is a very important factor. Think about it. Azerbaijan is a small country. We have signed an agreement in 1994 at the price of oil being about $18, $20 per barrel. See, and we were a very weak nation at that point. Today, the tables have turned. The price of oil is very high, and we have become a much more coherent nation. What hasn't happened, though, is we have not changed the terms of the agreement. For 14 years and counting, that 30-year-old contract is still in place. And that's important, because what happens is that if we begin changing contracts, in the middle of changing conditions, the circumstances, then you are not a trustworthy partner. That's an important part. So that was the first step. And the second thing we understood is in our part of the world, you cannot take one side only. You have to balance things off. And that balance has become the fundamental part of Azerbaijan's foreign policy. So we try not to upset everyone, uh, anyone, and we try to work with everyone, basically. In our part of the world, it's not an easy situation. But that contract, contract of the century, signed in 1994, became, um, they called it contract of the century. It was first worth $8 billion. Now the investment to go over $100 billion uh, into the <coughs> Azerbaijani oil sector. But $8 billion was the largest contract signed in the former Soviet Union in 1994. Not in Russia, which has more oil and gas than we do. Not in Kazakhstan, which has greater oil, uh, oil reserves. Not in Turkmenistan, which has oil greater gas reserves, but in Azerbaijan. What we also tried to do, we involved American companies, British companies, European companies, then we involved, uh, we tried to involve Iranian companies, but the uh, US government pushed us not to do that. We involved Turks and other people, Russians. So we tried to create a consortium where everyone benefits, or at least everyone has a stake. And it worked, because that's the only way you could move forward. So balancing is a very important part of Azerbaijan's foreign policy, and we continue to do that. It has become more difficult in the recent couple of, couple of months, for obvious reasons, because we all know about the situation in Georgia and uh, Russia, and uh, that is something which is, uh, which is unfortunate. What we also understood 
is that Azerbaijan cannot cannot be on its own. We cannot prosper and develop being alone. We can only prosper and develop if our region prospers and develops. If you you know if your neighbors are fine, you are fine too, more or less. So that and uh, and I'm not pitching for NAFTA, and this is a, this is an American deal. But we have our own situation. So what Azerbaijan has began doing is began working with Georgia and with Turkey on the development pipelines. And we saw it as a regional project, and we're still working with Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan Tech to bring their energy resources to the western side of the Caspian Sea because this way everyone prospers. Everyone benefits, everyone makes money. That's a good thing. The, the agreement, the partnership between Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey, which was championed by three presidents, Heydar Aliyev, Eduard Shevardnadze, and Suleyman Demirel of Turkey, with the strong support of the Clinton and actually Bush administrations, both has been probably the ex example of the most successful cooperation in Eurasia. I have not seen anything comparable to that. Azerbaijan and Georgian partnership has been a very important uh, element of our vision, of our outside approach. Of course, that 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 is an important part. We will try to build the region. We are very disturbed by what happens in the region today because, of course, the tension between our two neighbors, Russia and Georgia, are not beneficial. What we also understand is that, and something which we told our American friends for a long time, and European friends, that if you if you don't try to uh, to deal with the challenges, if you only go for easy stuff, <coughs> sooner or later it's going to explode. Something will blow up, and that's not going to work very well. Everyone knew that Abkhazia and South Ossetia in Georgia will, at some point, cause problems. No one took a serious effort to resolve it. Everyone thought, you know, it's, it's a frozen conflict, it's okay. It, it's never a frozen conflict, it's never okay. The war could happen. We have an ongoing, unresolved conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh, region of Azerbaijan, with our Armenian neighbors. That's a very unfortunate situation. We need to resolve it as soon as possible. I don't want to go into details of the war. It's it's not a pleasant situation, uh, but uh, no nation can tolerate an occupation of 20% of its international economic territory. That, I mean that that's unacceptable. No one would do that. So we, um, of course, have a serious problem with that. We need to resolve those issues, and we keep asking our American friends to be more committed. In fact, there's some good news I heard today that in, uh, that I. Bush administration has been much more active in the last couple of months on that, and then the Russian government is trying to solve it as well. Let me tell you why some of the things we do exist today in Azerbaijan. Although Azerbaijan, the Republic of Azerbaijan emerged, re emerged in 1991, it has a history. It, let me give you some of the rundown so you would understand where the vision comes from. In 1918, Azerbaijan became the first Muslim republic in the world, the first parliamentary republic in the Muslim world. You might be surprised to hear that in 1918, late 1918, the Republic of Azerbaijan granted equal voting rights to men and women alike before the United States of America. <laughs> so whenever people talk to me about gender, gender programs, I say yes, I appreciate your advice, thank you. Uh, but uh, when you, uh, that, that's an important factor. Azerbaijan also uh, is a home of the first opera in the Muslim world. Today we celebrate about 100 years old. It's, uh, it's called Le Live Majnun. Le Live Majnun is a Romeo and Juliet of the Middle West. That's what they call it. It's, um, so there is a certain history of understanding. Azerbaijan is also home to very diverse communities. Yes, about 90, 92% of Azerbaijan is Muslim, mostly Shia. Some, um, it's about 60, 40, 70, 30 split between Shia and Sunnis. But well, most people don't, don't make that distinction. We have a very strong, thriving, uh, thriving Jewish uh, community, which has been there for longer, quite a long time. I, um, I talked to a rabbi in, in one of the villages in the mountains of Azerbaijan. We, we call them mountain Jews because they live in the mountains. They speak a very distinct language. And I asked him, I said, I'm very happy that you know 
you live in this country. And he, and he said, it's my country. I've been here for 2,500 years. What are we talking about? <laughs> and that's true. That, that, is, that is as much as his country. It's my country. That's the, we, we live there. The, the Christian communities, the others. So it, it is a different... It's a good, it's a good environment there in many ways. I, let me tell you why it's important. Because <coughs> some things which seem very obvious to a Western ear do, do not come as simple in many places there. Azerbaijan identity is based on a civic identity. So for instance, regardless of who you are, you know, your race, your religion, your ethnicity, you are, if you're a citizen of Azerbaijan, you're a citizen of Azerbaijan. That's it. In fact, you know, whenever there was a radical ethno-nationalism or religious national uh, radicals come up to me and say, you know, this is a country of Muslims or this is a country of Azeris, I said, wait a second, let's go with me to the gravesite. Uh, there was a cemetery where the heroes of Azerbaijan were buried. Those are people who fought for the Azerbaijan, who fought in the war with Armenia and died. Among the first three people who died fighting in the war, for Azerbaijan, I both voted the, na the or the medal of a national hero of Azerbaijan. One is Russian, one is Jew, one is Azeri. And I said, you know what? That's how I believe. And uh, that's an important thing for us. I, I, very often people don't understand that. I'm hoping that our Armenian neighbors would understand this, because it's not only about ethnicity, it's about our future, how we build the region. Today, the United States and Azerbaijan have very strong partners. Let me give you an example. Azerbaijan is the supply the only Muslim uh, combat troops uh, as a part of the coalition in Iraq. It's about 125 people serving there. Azerbaijani troops served shoulder to shoulder in, in Afghanistan, and we just doubled our contingent. We have very good cooperation on those issues. It doesn't make people happy altogether. Um, outside our region or outside our country, we have certain questions frequently raised by our neighbors, be it Russians or be it Iranians. The Russians are mostly concerned about our close cooperation with, with the United States. The Iranians are mostly concerned about our close cooperation with Israelis and with uh, the United States as well. What we tell them is that our cooperation is not aimed against you. We're not playing against anyone. What we're trying to do, we're trying to enhance ourselves. What we're trying to do, we want to build a nation which can sustain itself. And that is something which will, I mean, look, if Israelis offer a good technology, why should I go and buy a bad technology for, for an ideological reason? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, if NATO provides good military training, why should I go for a bad military training? Because it's, I mean, that, that is totally intuitive. Yet, that's what people do. And this is something which underlined Azerbaijani vision of the region. That's a pragmatic approach. Pragmatism, uh, sometimes bordering on extreme pragmatism, let's put it that way, uh, is something which drives Azerbaijan. And we feel comfortable that I think decisions for the benefit of the nation should be done based on national interests in pragmatic views, not ideologically, not because of religious or other ideological reasons. Now, we don't always do that, all of us. Now, we should also, when we have the stereotypes, we apply to people like, this is a Muslim world, this is a Christian world, this is that, and this is it. We should remember that people live diverse lives. People are different, people make decisions because of what they believe in, and because of what they believe is good for them. And that's something which we should all remember, and I think that should be the driving force behind the decision-making processes in our part of the world. Now, I will just say a couple of words about what happens between Russia and Georgia. Georgia is a very dear friend, and it's, uh, it's very close to us. Russia has been uh, an, uh, a neighbor for a long time. We had a difficult relationship, but now it's getting better. And we're quite building quite friendly relations with the Russian Federation today. So we do not see them as an enemy. We, don't, we see them as a regional partner. So for us to see that conflict between two neighbors is very, is very disturbing. We don't want that to develop in anything further. We do recognize the territorial integrity of Georgia. 
because what we believe in is that the territorial integrity of any nation should be recognized. And we do not recognize it because it's convenient for us. But that, that's a paramount principle of our understanding because we believe that in practical terms that's what serves the interest the most. And let me uh, tell you this, that that selective approach to territorial integrity and what I believe, and many of Azerbaijan believe now, a uh, mistake made in Kosovo by recognition of the independence of Kosovo and by the Western nations have led to that explosion in Georgia. In a way, the Russians had said that they would, they would retaliate in Abkhazia and I said everyone knew that and that's what happened. Uh, and uh, we need to think about our actions and how they can backfire somewhere else. We do, for instance, have a significant Azeri population in Georgia. We have ethnic Azeri population in Iran, about 20 million people at the very least, or in Iran, of ethnic Azeri background. But we do not see them as a separatist force. We see them as citizens of those nations. Territorial integrity is important for us. So we, whenever the questions, we come up to both Georgians and in a friendly manner, it's a bit more difficult to talk to Iranians, but we do talk to them as well and say, look, help these people. If you need us to help you, if you need us to provide something, we'll do that. But those people are your citizens. You need to treat them nicely so nothing comes up. And we told those people as well that, you know what, you are our brothers, we love you very much to speak the same language, dance, same music, eat the same food, but you're a citizen of a foreign state. Remember that. We'll support you, we'll fight for your rights, everything, but you have to find a way to accommodate it within the state you live in. We've been actually trying to do that in Georgia, it's been very helpful. Today, Azerbaijani citizens of Georgia are among the most loyal Georgian citizens. Uh, in Iran, I think there's cert certain issues with, uh, with the freedom of speech and all this, uh, with, but I, they are not limited to Azerbaijani minority. That's, I think it's a general issue. Yeah. So that's where we stand today. I, um, I think I've talked, I've talked probably for too long already. So I think we should probably move to questions and answers. What do you think? Thank you. What do you think is Putin's strategy with all of these young republics like your own uh, at this time? What is Putin's strategy as you see it? <laughs> it is on the record conversation. <laughs> Russia has been growing in its assertiveness recently. And um, we've been hoping to see there is some signs of pragmatism in Russian policy. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily that everything is out, but there is a certain desire to reassert its former glory and you know this imperial feeling that we yes, it is still imperial hangover which hasn't passed completely, unfortunately. Strategy? I don't. That's a good word. I, I really don't know. And I don't think many people know what the strategy is. We think that uh, if if the approach is going to be, we're going to we want to have a stronger presence in the in the neighboring na nations. And Russia has a legitimate interest. No one has disputed that. That's a that's a major regional power. It should have so the presence. I don't mean military presence. I don't mean. Uh, physical presence, but I mean, they, if they want to have economic presence, if they want to have a say what happens in the neighborhood, yes, they do have at that time. But that should not be enforced. That should be done through the partnership with neighboring states. Our argument to the Russians has always been, look, a stable Azerbaijan, a stable Georgia are good for you. The more stable we all are, the better for you. There will be no violence, there will be no trafficking, there will be no radicalism. Come. You benefit from having a neighbor. Well, the United States benefits from having it in a stable Canada or, or Mexico. We're not, I, I don't think we're there yet. There are certain emotional outbursts uh, in the way Russia behaves. But I also think in the case of Georgia, it was mutual excessive emotionality, which did not help. Uh, and uh, we do, the Russian government has repeatedly told us that their approach to Georgia is that it's an exception rather than the, than the rule. We want to believe them. That's, that is something which certainly should be the case, although we, 
believe that even the exception of Georgia should be somewhat done with respect to the territorial integrity of Georgia, not the way it has been done. But we do have our own interests, and we need to have an opportunity to say no. And we have our balanced approach, which we say, you know, if what you offer coincides to what we need, we we'll, we'll say yes. If what you offer does not coincide to what we need, then we'll say no. Let me give you a very simple example. Over the last years, Russia has not been able to prevent Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, and our partners to build oil pipelines. However, Russian monopoly Gazprom controls much of the uh, European oil uh, gas supply. <coughs> And it's, we, we tell our friends, it's not because it's Russian. We just believe that any monopoly is not good. The more diversified you are, the better it is. The Caspian gas, including Azerbaijan gas, does provide that opportunity. We want to uh, diversify. We want to build uh, our access to the European markets. We will never dominate European markets. But we could contribute and be an additional supplemental supplier. Unfortunately, we often hear that we shouldn't do that. And we say, look, if we give you all our gas reserves uh, under the right to the Russian um, monopoly, then it doesn't serve our interests. And it, it's not anti-Russian, it's not pro-American, it's not it's pro <coughs> uh, That's what that what serves the interests of uh, Azerbaijan, and we'll continue trying to build that. And uh, I do hope that there's a certain understanding in Moscow, the need for building a stronger neighborhood. Hopefully. Again? Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned the uh, unfortunate uh, problems that you have with your neighbor Armenia. And uh, two questions there. To, to go, for example, to your province of Nakhichevan, have to go to Baku and then fly over there as opposed to just visiting it from Armenia. And then, really unfortunate, uh, I don't know care about. Do you see any chance of you reaching any kind of peace in your lifetime with Armenia? We have been in, in, engaged since 1992 in, a, in the peace talks. I'm co-chaired by OEC Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, under the auspice of so-called Minsk Group. Minsk Group has been recently co-chaired by Russia, France, and the United States. But on the ground, there will be no change. And since the ceasefire of 1994, uh, there will be no movement, and the refugees have lived the way you in exile, the borders are closed, and the, uh, the occupation continues. I do hope that there is a there is a light at the end of the tunnel. First of all, to be honest, it's my job to hope that. I, I work for the foreign ministry, that's what we do. But the another reason is that this situation cannot continue as it does. And first of all, it doesn't benefit the Armenian side. Let me tell you why. By putting its ethnic interests above vision of the region, what Armenia has done is that it won a small battle uh, with the help of the Russian Federation. Most of Armenian advances have been backed by the Russians, and they are still, that's why Armenia has about two or three Russian bases on the state, but they're building a new one now. What Armenia has done is put itself in complete dependence on the, uh, into the Russian Federation, to the Russian, that's not a good thing. You cannot balance if you only depend on one side. Another problem is that if you don't have a relation with your neighbors, then it's difficult to develop. Our region, the Caucasus, is an integral part. We we all are handicapped by the fact that Armenia is not a part of the region. But Armenia is is handicapped more than anyone else. And that's that's a decision which people should do. The decision they have to how do they perceive their future. If we only look at our past and if we only look at our grievances, historic grievances, valid or not, that's that's a different issue. But we we'll only look at our grievances and base our behavior on based on our grievances will never end. If we look at the future and say, what kind of region do we want to build? This is a historic opportunity. And the, the time the clock is ticking, we're missing time, we're losing time. If we don't build a region together, 
I don't know what's next. We might have missed the opportunity already. Look what happened to the Balkans. They have looked in the past. They, you, you talk to, I, I talked to Serbs about uh, Kosovo. They talked, they told me about 1650 something happened. Then Albanian states, I, I, yes, maybe very bad things happened in 1650. I don't know. But the most important thing that we need, there was no need because of that to provoke bombing of, of, uh, of both Kosovo and of Belgrade. I think Armenian leadership understands that towards moving, that if, if it wants to be a part of the region, it needs to be moving towards more pragmatic uh, direction. And actually, what, recently we've seen some, we've seen some positive hopeful signs. We'll see. If pragmatism dominates, we might get something. There's also a feeling that both the United States and Russia, after the conflict in Georgia, understands the necessity of solving the issue uh, sooner rather than later. But. You know, it's been there for quite a long time, 20 years. Thank you. Next question. You, inf I think so. you inferred in your talk that the rights of women in Azerbaijan was fairly progressive for your part of the world, and yet you told us over 90% of the people are Muslim. Can you compare the rights of women in Azerbaijan to Western women, Europe, United States? Uh, Ma'am, if I may, I didn't understand the connection in terms of yet. Uh, you said you women have rights, yet the, you're Muslim. That is a that's a, that's a strange connector for me. Knowing that some Muslim nations have very strict regulations on women, and you have a lot of Muslim members in your country, can you compare the rights of women in Azerbaijan to Europe or America? Um, Yes, it's a good question because you don't you don't compare the rights of people in Azerbaijan to people in, in Europe and in America. The reason being because you compare America and, and Europe and America and Canada. And so it doesn't apply only to women, it applies to everyone. I can compare them to non Muslim neighbors of Azerbaijan and our rights are just fine. We need to look in the context of the region. What happens is that the region develops as a whole, as we don't develop separate from Georgia, for instance, which is a Christian nation, or Armenia, which is a Christian nation, or Russia, which is a predominantly Christian nation. You develop as a part of the region. So compared to that, it's fairly progressive. We have women ambassadors, we have women ministers. You know, we just had a, our first lady is a very, very active person. We have uh, members of parliament who are women. I, the constitution of Azerbaijan does not specify what religion you are. You just say that you're a citizen of Azerbaijan. That's an important factor. Being Muslim does not mean that you do not respect the rights of women. My, for instance, as I said, we granted rights of women to vote before the United States was done, and that's not the Muslim nation. My grandmother, but both grandmothers, uh, medical doctors. My mother is a professor of physics. So when I say I don't understand the connector, is that we are seeing we're talking about stereotype in many ways. If we look at the Middle East, for instance, with the exception of Israel, for instance, you mostly have the societies which are still going to quite traditional change from traditional society to non-traditional to modern society. So that's where you have those problems. They are not specifically linked to Islam, though sometimes it could be Islam can be used as an excuse. For instance, in neighboring Iran, you have to wear uh, you have to wear well if you're a woman. I, I don't think it has much to do with Islam per se, as much as it has to do with the uh, with the um, uh, Iranian revolutionary perception of the world. That's how they think is a good thing. Sometimes we move backwards. Women in Iraq had apparently had more freedom under Saddam Hussein than they do now, in terms of men and women. I mean, they were both oppressed, but equally oppressed. So um, now they are equally oppressed. I mean, those are interesting things. And that country was just liberated by the non-Muslim folks. So I, I would be careful to make that connection. The most prominent politicians in, I mean, the United States is yet to elect a woman 
به نظر بود تو was noted but she served as a prime minister تام سوچیلا served as a prime minister prime minister of Turkey uh, there was a prime minister there was a prime minister and president of uh, Billy Bangladesh which is a Muslim the Muslim it's I don't I don't like that connector I don't like I, I don't look at it, at my neighbors as saying you know you're a good guy but you're a Christian He's a good guy or he's a bad guy. I mean, regardless of who, what he believes in. So I think we we need to be careful with that. I think Azerbaijan and Central Asia and the Caucasus generally stand as an anti antithesis to the idea of national civilizations. If we can all look at each other as partners and say, look, I judge on your merits. That's fine. I can live with it. But if they come up to me and say, because you're a Muslim, you're there, and because I'm Christian, I'm here, then I have no choice. I'm not going to renounce my identity and my religion only because someone decides to box me in a certain position. That's not what we like. What we like to say is, look, we could all live together, we could all cooperate, regardless of the fact that we might privately believe in something, which is the faith of every individual. We, we had a long conversation today with Kim about this. I think um, the president of Azerbaijan, Hamadi, just in his interview to an American journalist said a very interesting thing. He said, Islam is deeply rooted in, my, in our hearts and our culture, but not in our politics and our states. You know, it's it's your personal belief. Yeah, I cannot tell people, you know, you, you can go to synagogue, you could go to the, to the church, you could go to the mosque. I mean, is between a God and a human being. So I would not expect a woman to be affected by the dominant <coughs> Well, uh, in our current economic meltdown, the credit issues with our banks and the market here in the U.S., what effect is that having in your country? I think the, well, indirect effect, the drop of oil well, oil price has had some effect because our major support, mm -hmm. major contribution to the budget comes from gas and oil sales. For some reason, I think because of Azerbaijani government's very conservative <coughs> investment policy, um, we have not been fully engaged into this recent um, recent problem. But if if the problem goes further, we might face. Um, we might face certain problems, um, certain, certain challenges. For instance, the fall of dollar uh, affects our reserves because we have a lot of reserves in dollars. I mean, most of our reserves are in dollars. Azerbaijan oil fund, which is the what we call the fund for the future, and it um, it, can, it basically accumulates fund funding for the years to come and for strategically important projects, is in dollars and is held in a different. Western institutions, including the American institutions. I'm actually kind of impressed that they chose wisely. I realize that none of the institutions they invested has failed so far. But uh, that's a good news. But the, I mean, you never know how it goes. Uh, but we invested very, very, very conservatively, and mostly into the into the banks themselves on the, and the government bonds and all those things. Not really, not in the stock market. So so far, it's okay. But yes, sir. Yeah, I'll come over there. Hello, is this working? Yes. Yeah. I can feel you without the mic. <laughs> <laughs> you find out, sir, you explain to us how essential stability in your region is to the continued success of your country. Uh, I would ask relative to that, how do you see the continued presence of a large United States military force in the region with regards to the future stability of the region? Uh, which force do you mean, in Iraq or Iraq. Jay? In Iraq. In Iraq. Iraq. Particularly, but then the region in general. I'll settle for Iraq. <laughs> Afghanistan is an easier uh, situation in a way to understand than Iraq. Uh, we should not forget that September 11th didn't happen, did happen, <laughs> that uh, the United States was attacked, and by all accounts, the 
planning and much of it has happened in Afghanistan. Some of it happened in Hamburg and London, but you know, that's a different issue. So the response to the situation in Afghanistan is kind of understandable. Uh, what the long-term strategy is, it's a good question. In Iraq, once you break it, you own it. I mean, uh, the, uh, you go into Iraq, it was a, it was an unpleasant government, let's put it that way. But it did keep the country together. There was no sectarian violence. Now we have that. Now Iraq, the people of Iraq deserve a certain future. And we can't just abandon them. I mean, but, yeah, and there's this moral element, but there's also a practical element. With American and the Western coalition invasion in general, what happened in Iraq that we have a domination of Shia, uh, Shia government, political forces. First of all, those are forces which are not based on, uh, on uh, civic identity. They are not Iraqi. They are the descendants of a Shia Iraqi, which is a big difference. The second problem is, of course, so they, they see others as kind of a, at least junior partners, at, at best, and in most cases, enemies. That does provide Iran with a certain um, increased strength because Iran is an ideological share. Now, I, I, I am nominally a share, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to advocate against my brothers. What I'm trying to say is that really anything in excess is really not good. Everything is good in moderation. So too many shares running around having too much power is really not a good idea. Also, you have the, the Iraq, which has turned from a unpredictable and erratic secular government into dangerously religious dominated uh, nation. So this is something which should be overcome. We need to help Iraqis to move forward. Now, how exactly that's being done? And do we need a very large US presence? Do we need to move forward without without US forward? That Those are things which need to be negotiated. And I think some of the some of the recent events in under under General Petrus, in for instance, in a, uh, in a, in very difficult Diyawa and other parts of Iraq, have been quite successful. They need to hand it more to Iraqis and try to find a way. Uh, although some of the things, of course, were based simply on ethnic separation, that's not a good thing. But we need to make sure that Iraq exists as a state, that it comes at least 10, 15 years from now better off than it used to be. That's a long way to go. And, and I, for me personally, I, I understand that the better, the sooner American forces get out of Iraq, the better for Americans here and the probably people will be celebrating it. But what will happen after that quick celebration, I don't know. And that's what we need to be very, very careful of. And by itself, the presence of American forces in the region, I don't know if that's such a negative thing. Again, it's, I mean, what they do. If they're actively engaged in a military action, of course, that would upset people. If they help to equip and train forces and they, they cooperate with the local governments and there was a consent of the national government, you know, why not? Depends. Yes, sir. We've got a question here and then we'll come over there. Uh, yes, sir. Um, for, uh, for many years, I worked uh, for an energy company who uh, was an original signatory to the contract of the century that you referred to. The NAFCO? Uh, this uh, Unical. Yes, and uh, I uh, would like to reiterate to the audience here just how unique and uh, how impressive that contract uh, has been for not only your country, but for, uh, for, for, for the energy supplies of the West. It is, uh, it is definitely one of a kind in the world. And my belief has always been that uh, it represents a, very much a win-win situation uh, for, the, for the parties to that contract. My question is relates to the, the election that uh, we're uh, in right now for, uh, for new president. And, and I'm wondering, as, as your country follows that election, uh, for the two different candidates, uh, are you concerned about the, the change of uh, energy policy for the U.S. and how it might uh, affect uh, Azerbaijan? 
Thank you, sir. First of all, thank you for uh, Unicorn has been a very good partner, and I remember Ambassador Mareska working with uh, Mr. White, and uh, they've, been, they've done a great job in the region. Thank you. We also had just election just recently. Uh, they electing our president for the second term uh, in Hamani, and it was an overwhelming victory. So I first thought you refer to that. Now I understand that you refer to the American election. <laughs> We normally don't comment on the internal politics of the nation who are accredited to that's a part of our protocol. Another part of our reality, though, is that while we do not participate in the election of a president of the United States, who gets elected and what policies are implemented actually affects everyone. It's a global leader. I mean, I'm sure that people in Afghanistan and in Iraq are watching it with a lot of anxiety because that affects their lives and affects our lives as well. I have to give credit to both previous Democratic administrations of Mr. Clinton and the uh, administration of the Republican administration of Mr. Bush. Both have been consistent, quite, quite consistent, up until uh, the situation deteriorated in Iraq, significant, consistent in support to understand the vision towards the region, both Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Central Asia as a whole. They always understood it was a bipartisan understanding of the need to develop uh, ties with our region. And it's been actually, even the last days of the Bush administration, you could see strong commitment on it. So in a way, I think because that relationship serves the national interest of the United States, whatever administration comes into power, uh, you know, they will always understand that that's a necessary relationship, that that benefits America and benefits nations in the region. Now, the question which we have is that, and that's what we're trying to convince our friends in Washington on both sides of the aisle, is that that commitment should not be interrupted. <coughs> I, I understand that there should be a transition time that the administration, new administration comes, they need to change people, they need to help, that's all understandable. But uh, we cannot allow for the attention to be distracted for all because simply because we live in a region which is very difficult and volatile. And you know, other people don't, other nations don't have the same challenges the United States has in terms of changing administrations. So I, I am confident that any administration which comes in will be positive in terms of building relationships with our region. Our, as I said, our concern is that how early within an administration that realization will re-emerge. And uh, in that respect, I really don't have a preference either way. I would say I think both, both campaigns have at least had people who have been quite vocal in understanding of our religion, of what it is. For instance, on the democratic side, you have people like, um, and I know he's not officially involved, but people like, for instance, uh, Holbrook and others who have, who have the vision for the region, who understand what it is, Belubin, who knows the situation. On the Republican side, of course, uh, Senator McCain himself has been involved in the region. So there, there's a certain understanding on both sides, and we're hopeful that uh, we're hopeful that that understanding translates in the continuation of policy. We have time for one last question. That means I talk too much. <laughs> this is back to an energy uh, question. The eventual markets for your oil and gas uh, are Turkey and Western Europe, and uh, then your neighbor across the Caspian Sea, Turkmenistan, with its huge gas reserves. Where do they? Where are their markets? Where does that gas end up? In terms of oil. As you know, it doesn't matter. We just ship it to the uh, to the tank that goes wherever it goes. In terms of uh, no, I mean you know it's uh, it's you know it's a global commodity. With gas, yes, it's Turkey and, and Western Europe. For the first time, we began supplying uh, gas directly to EU via a Turkey Greece gas link. Now, Turkmen gas, for the most part today goes to the Russian system. Much of the gas which uh, Gazprom sells to Western Europe is a marked up Turkmen gas. And that's what happens when you don't have options. 
there was a time in, Azer in Azerbaijan, in 1990s, that there was a saying, I'm sure Kim remembers it very well, it was a multiple, a happiness is multiple pipelines. It's true, I mean, the, the more options you have, the better it is. We have, Azerba in case of Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan is neither a source and a seller of the gas, nor a, nor a consumer, final consumer. So for us, we were supportive of Trans-Caspian projects, we think it could, it could work out very well. But at the end of the day, it is up to the Turkmen's uh, whether they want to sell their gas to Europeans or not, and up to the Europeans whether they want to buy and make a commitment to buy uh, gas, gas from a different source. <laughs> we as a transit counter open, we just got actually the feasibility study and we did it on a, um, a transit opportunities, it looks all fine. But when we build our pipelines, we didn't ask others to to take the lead. We asked others to participate. So we're ready there. But again, uh, if uh, that's a decision up to the Turkmen government, it's their gas, and up to the Europeans if they want to have diverse of supplies. If they don't, then you know it's up to them. <laughs>